Well, good morning and welcome to the Spheria webinar on the benefit of allocating to small caps. My name is Mark Cormack from Pinnacle Investment. Pinnacle are equity partners and work alongside Spheria to distribute the Spheria small and microcap funds to the Australian financial advisory marketplace. And joining me on today's webinar are both the founders and lead portfolio managers of Spheria, Marcus Burns and Matthew Booker. In terms of today's webinar, um, I'd just like to give you a brief background on the Spheria business. Spheria are an independent fund management boutique who specialise in small and microcap investing. Since establishing the Spheria microcap fund, the team has delivered a 17% return in the last 12 months and a 21% per annum return since inception, which is 7% over the index. And the Spheria Small Companies Fund has delivered a 23% return over the last 12 months and 16% per annum return, and, a, uh, and an outperformance rate of 4% per annum over the ASX Small Ordinaries Accumulation Index. In addition to the managed funds, Spheria also manages the Spheria Emerging Companies Listed Investment Company, which is, an, is another way investors can access Spheria's investment capabilities via a direct LIC. In terms of an update on capacity, Spheria are now managing in excess of $660 million across all strategies. And we'd like to remind our listeners <coughs> that capacity is certainly constrained within the microcap, uh, the microcap strategies. And we currently have around $20 million to go in the retail fund. So this means within the ensuing months, we'll be looking to close this fund as we approach $250 million. Saying that, we certainly would encourage anyone who's looking to invest in the fund to allocate sooner rather than later. Before we kick off, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Today's Spheria presentation will last around 15 to 20 minutes and that will be followed by a Q&A session, which all attendees have the opportunity to ask questions at the bottom of your screen. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Marcus Burns and Matthew Booker for today's presentation. Thanks, gentlemen. Thanks, Mark. It's Marcus Burns here. Um, I'm KPM from the fund and co-founders. So we thought we'd just take you through a couple of highlights on um, the fund in terms of recent additions to the portfolio and then talk a bit about um, the process again and give, and give you a couple of examples as well as giving some flavour on, on why we think small caps are an exciting place to be investing and, and allocating investor capital. So just uh, so people often ask for a quick summary of the results season and we don't, uh, don't tend, tend, tend to get to a, like a top-down level view of that but it was generally um, an inline results season. There were some surprises up and down. We saw some pretty extreme moves, um, both positive and negative. So any stock that beat numbers tended to be uh, very aggressively re-rated upwards, and stocks that missed even by a slight amount saw a very strong move downwards. So it's really more of a volatile season than we actually expected. Although net net, um, the overall results for the small cap index weren't particularly were actually pretty good compared to previous years. Um, how do we trade and how do we invest through that period of time? We've uh, basically topped up a couple of key positions. So we've spoken about Monodelphus before which is an engineering contracting company we've had in the portfolios for some time. It's made investors quite a lot of money. The stock had pulled back a little bit into the results. It delivered an exceptionally good result in the first half with all the hallmarks we look for, great cash flow conversion, good, you know, great balance sheet, um, and management are very conservative with their outlook. And uh, on the back of that and the fact that we had an update with the management team getting some colour around how they saw the future evolving, in particular around the iron ore space, so all the iron ore companies in Australia have been milking current assets and effectively underinvesting in their in the base. And all of them, Rio, BHP, and Fortescue have got to reinvest substantial amounts of capital to basically replenish all reserves and, and the cap capability to, to produce all reserves in the future. And we think that Monodelphus is very well positioned to benefit from some of that work and pick up and increase the top line going forward. Importantly also, they're growing their maintenance business very well, um, which is much more of a recurring style of revenue stream. That's showing great, uh, pro great progress, great promise, and they're taking quite a lot of market share from some of their key players in that space. So on the back of that and the fact that the shares are pulled back, we still see a very attractive op you know, opportunity there. We've actually increased that, um, that weighting in, in all the portfolios and, and the small caps. And then another one we've, we've talked about previously is Bigger Cheese, um, which is kind of morphing from a dairy producing company to becoming more of a branded consumer goods style business. It's very ably run by some extremely capable management team that, that have um, navigated a fairly volatile dairy industry over the, over the years. But they've uh, managed to think counter-cyclically and invest capital when people are frightened to and, and conversely um, pull capital out of the industry when people are getting greedy, um, and, you know, which is exactly the kind of philosophy and, and approach we like to, to, you know, to support and see with management teams. Um, we also learned that, um, as, you, as you know, they bought Vegemite um, off Mondelez, which is a former craft business. 
Um, and we see that as a fantastic acquisition for the company. It's a very stable earning stream, incredibly reliable um, revenue stream for the business. We believe there's some, some strong latent pricing power in that business going forward. Um, so on the back of that, and, and the fact the stock hadn't done much for the last six months or so, we, uh, we added gently to that position in the portfolios. We, we don't usually get bullish, bullish on acquisitions, but this acquisition, we believe, is uh, very, uh, very wise, a very wise investment for them. Uh, Vegemite was obviously owned by an American company. I don't think they fully appreciated the strength of Vegemite. And as Marcus said, there's a lot of pricing power. There's a pricing lever they can pull with that. They haven't pulled the price up yet because they wanted to keep the peanut butter shelf space in Woolworths and Coles. And so there's been a moratorium on price increases on Vegemite to keep that shelf space. But they were expected to lose that shelf space in peanut butter. It's a very lucrative shelf space. They have about 65% market share in peanut butter. It is now called uh, Vega peanut butter rather than Kraft peanut butter. The recipe is the same. And they've maintained that shelf space. They're effectively keeping Kraft out of the market um, by not pushing price on Vegemite. So it's a very appealing acquisition for us. I don't think the market fully appreciates the upside in that acquisition. And like I said, we're not usually the guys that go out and by companies that acquire things, but in this case we believe this acquisition is highly accretive. Moving on to the media sector, we have increased our positions in the media sector. Um, what we've seen is it's become very unpopular to own media stocks, uh, yet most of them are generating strong cash flow. Um, parts of the media market are actually growing, despite, um, despite consensus believing they're not. And we think there's room for significant consolidation, and with consolidation there'll be uh, significant cost out across the industry and yet revenues could potentially grow. So you'll have double leverage in terms of revenues growing and costs coming out. We recently added uh, Seven West Media to the portfolio. What we've seen is the actual TV market has begun to grow and it's growing substantially and we'll talk about that later in the presentation. But we're finding, uh, definitely finding good opportunity in the media sector. Uh, we've talked about this before. We actually think that M&A is going to be a big part of the space. It always is in the small cap space. Uh, the foreign corporates are very active. We've seen a lot of takeovers, uh, particularly um, um, Japanese and American companies coming down here and buying smaller companies that have a strategic position in the market. We've also got private equity type players that have significant capital at the moment to de deploy. Um, pretty much every second week there's an acquisition in the small cap space and there's a private equity player involved. Uh, what we're also seeing is just the hyper-popular companies, there's a handful of companies that continue to skyrocket. Um, there's no valuation underpinned to a lot of these companies. Bellamy, for example, is a $2.5 billion company. It's only got $350 million of sales. To give you context, Blackmore's has over 700 mil of sales and has a market cap less than Bellamy's. So we think some of these companies are getting overcooked. Um, some of the other ones that we would mention are Levisa, Next DC, Altium and Costa Group, where they've all had massive runs and valuation is an afterthought in most of these names. The price is going up for now and that's working in people's favour, but eventually that could come unstuck. Anyway, we'll move on to the next slide. Hmm. Turning to page five, um, we've uh, actually shown this slide, this slide before, but we just wanted to re-highlight re, you know, this, uh, actually, sorry, page four. Page four, which is the team. Um, you've seen our uh, our faces before, we just want to flag that we've hired a, uh, a new analyst to join the team, a guy called Olivia Kaloon, who um, basically worked at Bankers Trust for over 11 years in the small microcap space. And he brings with him a wealth of experience and enthusiasm and passion to the team. And so we're really pleased to announce that he's joined the team and, and uh, you know, built out um, the investment capability of the firm. And so far, being a great fit. Turning to page five, we're in the cycle. We've shown a chart like this similarly uh, before, but just wanted to flag that we see. Some, some, as Matt kind of flagged to you, there's, some, there's a couple of names in the, in the, in the small cap space that keep getting re-rated based on um, ever-increasing earnings growth, but, but effectively the multiples that people are paying for these names we think are, are fairly egregious. And also we think at the bottom end of that, in the fintech space, where you've got, similarly, you've got stocks that have a, um, an attractive story, usually around disruption, usually around some kind of payment systems. Um, we're seeing a lot of market cap given to names well in advance of their earnings and cash flows. And uh, the chart just shows, you know, where we're in that in that cycle. If you look, at, if you go back into a simple screen, looking at companies that have very little revenue, say less than two million dollars of revenue, um, and yet a fair amount of market cap. In this case, more than 100 million dollars of market cap. This is what this is the kind of chart you see going back over 25 years, and we're at an all-time high relative in Australia of about 50 odd names that, that basically meet that criteria. So we just, you know, we just urge some caution around some of those names where 
you know, maybe one or two will become real businesses and, and actually disrupt something. But there are a lot of stocks in that, in that space that we feel have got very groovy names and not very groovy balance sheets or cash flow. Um, you know, Big Un being a particularly egregious example of that, which is now in suspension and looks like to have been some kind of fraud. So we just flag that you know, we, we think that the fundamentals um, you know, we, 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 you know, we invest on, I mean, we tend to miss these kind of names, but equally when they, ro- when they wash out, which they will do at some stage in the future, uh, our portfolio is protected from that kind of downside. Turning to page six, we just wanted to uh, talk a bit about small cap space again and just highlight why we think looking out many years, it's, it remains a very attractive and interesting space to have exposure to. Um, obviously, people think that in small, there's fantastic growth. In some cases, there is. Um, but there's also, we just flagged, there's a greater, greater dispersion and opportunity set to invest in than perhaps you have in the large cap space. So we just flagged the two indices here, the small cap index on the left-hand side and the top 100 index on the right that many clients are exposed to. And what really stands out from that is just how fragmented and how much more diverse the small cap index is, both in terms of the sectors and actually the constituents of those stocks. So there's 200 stocks uh, and then smaller news index. There's only 100, obviously, in the top 100 by definition. But within that, you've got four banks equaling pretty close to 40% of that large cap index. Two or three resource names give you another 17, 18%. So it's very, very concentrated in the top 10 stocks there within that, within the top 100. Um, if you look at the small and reason index, you've got a much greater dispersion of opportunities. Like I think the largest stock is about two, two and a half percent of the index, and it really does get fragmented beneath that. So it's much more of a stock pickers market um, with much greater opportunity to invest in different subsectors and themes than you get in the large cap space. And we think that provides great opportunity for clients over the medium term to find interesting themes, not just being driven by two, the two dominant themes, the large cap index being resources and banking. It's also where a lot of M&A activity and IPO activity occurs. We've benefited historically from very selectively buying IPOs that, that meet our criteria. We've gone for around about one in 10 IPOs looking back over the last four or five years, which feels to us like about the right ratio. Um, we, we are selective. We look for ones with, with good history um, yeah, ability to generate cash flow and management teams who tend to retain a good, good chunk of equity. Um, we tend to avoid those that are more speculative. And on the M&A side, as Matt said, we've, we've been beneficiaries of that in the last quarter or so with Certex and ADLE both being taken out. Um, and so it's a nice side adjunct to what we do. If we find businesses that have all the right bottom-up criteria, typically foreign firms or, or corporates or, or indeed private equity firms, also find some of those, um, you know, some of those criteria very attractive as a way to invest. So we think the combination of that, of that dispersion of, of, of themes, uh, the M&A activity and IPO activity, means that we have a very fertile space and indeed a quite differentiated space to invest in vis-a-vis the large cap index. Just, uh, just segueing into Surtex, we do prefer to look forward rather than backward, but uh, I think Surtex gives you a flavour of how we think. And if you look at Surtex, and it was a company where the risk was skewed to the downside when it was trading at $30, $40. And then it went through some trials. The trials weren't as appealing as I suppose the market guessed, uh, suspected they were going to be, and we go into that, but um, they rushed the trials effectively. Uh, but the share, share price was knocked down to $10, $11 last year and it actually became a value stock. Um, and, and we actually think there was good growth potential in the business despite the trials not proving, um, proving the upside, I suppose, in the, in the case that, that we believe is there. But if you go through uh, the tick the box kind of process around this company, it is highly free cash flow generative, generative business. It had net cash balance sheet of 120 million when we bought it. Um, you know, it was, when it was trading below $12, it was on uh, EV to EBIT multiple of 10 times, and that's 10 times free cash flow. It operated in a market where there were only two players. It was seeking approval in the US in a big part of the US market, in the HCC market. Uh, through the FDA, which would have seen it actually increase its penetration in the market. They'll probably get that approval in the next few months. Um, the product um, we've discussed before has less side effects than the alternative, which is chemotherapy. As most of you would probably know, the side effects with chemotherapy are, are quite, um, quite aggressive. And the only issue they had was some weaker trial results than was expected. Now, if we move on to the next slide, just shows you our dashboard in terms of slide eight for Surtex. You can see the history in that top left chart in terms of free cash flow generation. There was a hiccup in 17, but going forward, um, the spend in terms of the capex spend on trials had completed. So you, you, were, you were going to see an increase in cash flow going forward, and you were going to see an increase in penetration for the product going forward. The penetration rate for the product 
is mid single digit and we think over time it would have increased substantially and with that increase in penetration you would have seen significant cash flow um, to shareholders over time. You can see the margin history is also quite, um, quite uh, sustainable and um, is quite lucrative in terms of the 20% cash margin which is pretty, pretty strong in that sort of market. And then in terms of the risk scorecard, you know, net cash balance sheet, good interest cover. In terms of where the, the product and the, and the business was positioned in the market, it rated very highly on all, on all our bases. And you can see that we rated the company very highly. So when it was trading at $12, we had the, over a $20 valuation. Um, what we saw in January was that, um, you know, there was a couple of bidders that came in uh, and looked at the company and what transpired was that uh, the ultimate bid paid $28 for the company. So that's a cash bid. The unfortunate thing is we're going to lose one of our biggest holdings. Um, the good thing is, you know, we've doubled our money in a short period of time earning Surtex. So it just gives you an idea of how we think and how that translates from the business into the portfolio. Uh, moving on to Navitas, which is slide nine. Marcus yeah. will discuss that. Yeah, that's why you uh, have a glass of water. Yeah, thanks, Matt. <laughs> just on Navitas, we, we've... Um, Recently bought into Navitas, or actually added to the position, um, and I guess what we find attractive about Navitas is it's gone through, uh, not not unlike Certex in some ways, some form of transition. So it had a very lost a very large contract with Macquarie University recently, um, which I think basically scared investors off the whole process of the business. But it actually um, has managed to grow the core business despite the loss of, of Navitas. So I guess what we flag is that it lost $50 million of, of revenue with uh, with lots of that. Macquarie contract and also lots of a small contract with the government on English language teaching. Despite that, its revenue sorry, even only down $25 million. So that kind of highlights the fact that the core business has managed to grow in the background. Um, what they've done recently is go back and recontract with many of their um, university partners and actually extended the terms of those contracts from five years to close to 10 years. And in many cases, turn those into joint venture arrangements. So they're we feel that the, the core business now has actually got a lot more stability to it and a lot more um, longevity to it than it had maybe previously. Um, we, we, we've heard that, that the fact that Macquarie left hasn't actually been great for, the, for Macquarie University. They've, they've actually lost a lot of those foreign students that used to come through the UP pathways uh, into, that, into that university. So it still remains a very attractive way for universities to attract graduates. Um, and very lucrative for both Navitas and for universities to sort of partner up on these, in these programs. Um, as you can see from the chart there, uh, Navitas has been an excep exceptionally good cash flow generating business. It's converted over 100% of the earnings to, to free cash flow, which is kind of stock we like. Balance sheet's got a bit of gearing, but it's fairly undergeared. And it's going through a management transition now where the founder's basically stepping back to become a chairman and um, CFO taking over as CEO. So we think there's a possibility there for some, for some reasonably good cost savings to go through and, and also further increase the earnings looking forward. Um, so we think a you know, background of attractive foreign students coming to Australia, great cash flow generation, pretty sound balance sheet, and valuation we think is reasonably attractive. Um, has you know yielded a pretty strong investment case for us. So we've we've actually added that 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 stock to our, our funds and growing that position over time. So just moving on to slide ten. So by stealth, the actual TV, the free-to-air TV market is actually growing again. So these numbers are up to the end of February 2018, and you can see the actual metropolitan market is 2.2 billion dollars in revenue. This is data from Standard Media Index, so it's independent data. The market started to grow basically in the second half of last year, and you've seen pretty strong growth where the last quarter of the year you actually saw 9% growth in the TV ad market. Now over that time, despite um, you know, the negativity around the market and the players in the market, the Channel 9 share price has actually risen 100, 126%, including dividends. So you could have made a lot of money out of Channel 9. We did look at it a year ago, and we were just concerned about the cash flow conversion and a few other things. But the Channel 9 team has done an excellent job executing and winning market share, and also they benefited from the growth in the market as well. So going forward, um, what we're hearing, basically TV, we saw an in industry body, body the other day, TV has the best return on investment in terms of the advertising market. Now, eyeballs are fragmenting, obviously social media, digital, uh, etc. are driving fragmentation in the market. But people who watch TV, it actually resonates, the advertising on TV, whereas for social media, etc., it doesn't resonate. People flick through it, they don't actually see the ads. And so what you're seeing is that advertisers and clients are moving back towards TV. Procter & Gamble, which is one of the biggest spenders globally in the market, 
cut its, cut its digital advertising budget by $200 million last year. They saw no impact on their return. Basically, that $200 million was just a waste of money in the first place. So what you're seeing is clients are gravitating back towards TV. Uh, radio is also seeing some growth, and yet the market um, is, is basically not, um, not, uh, is not imputing this into share prices, except for in the case of Channel 9. So what we're finding is a lot of opportunity in TV, um, TV stocks. Um, we think there'll be consolidation in the market. The other positive aspect to the market is the competition for sporting rights is waning. I think that the players in the market, the TV um, players, are saying, hey, hang on, we've been spending too much money on sporting rights, and that's happening globally, and it's going to happen in Australia as well. So that big spend on sporting rights, which has been eating up margins, we think will wane going forward and you'll see um, much more cost out from the TV networks, potentially in a growing top-down environment. So there could be a good story here. We move on to slide 11. We recently took a meaningful position in Prime Media. We have owned a position for a while. We've increased that substantially. Why we like Prime Media is actually its earnings and cash flow have been stable over time. They've been generating anywhere from, uh, probably averaging about $50 million of free cash flow over the past five years, despite headwinds in the industry. So you have seen revenue declining in the regional TV markets. Now, regional TV has started to grow again in the last quarter. So you're starting to see growth return to that market. It's a very stable business. It has an affiliation agreement with Channel 7, which obviously is the biggest player in the market. There is a fear out there that Channel 7, when they renew the affiliation agreement, um, it's due to renew 30 June 2019. Negotiations will start 1st of July 2018, so it's coming up pretty soon. There's a fear out there that Channel 7 is going to take Prime to the cleaners. We do not believe that's the case. The other two licensees um, have renewed contracts to 30 June 2021, which means Channel 7 has no alternative but to deal with Prime. Now, Prime actually represents one-third of Seven West Media's earnings, so they basically pay an affiliation fee to Channel 7, and it is $100 million a year or thereabouts, which is one-third of Seven's earnings at the moment. They do not want to jeopardise that one-third of their earnings, so we believe that Channel 7 will come to the table and the two parties will come to a mutually acceptable agreement. If they do not, the current agreement extends out for the next, um, basically extends out into the future. Uh, on the current terms, which is quite lucrative for, for Prime Media. The, co the company's currently trading on two and a half times free cash flow, so basically we'll get our money back in two and a half years and we'll have a free option after that. So we actually think there's a compelling argument here and we think um, strategically it makes sense for, actual, for actually for Channel 7 to take out Prime Media. And Prime's actually did geared in, in the last couple of years as well, so Matt Slag has been paying, you know, had great cash flow, paid good dividends to us, but also it's gone through a massive degearing process. So by the end of this fiscal year, it'll be it'll be net cash. Yeah, it won't have um, any debt. So it's in a great position to be negotiating with with Channel Seven, um, and you know the balance sheet's pristine. So we think it's very cheap. Moving on, just in terms of performance, you can see on slide 12, 12 that the last month was a bit difficult for us. The market dipped early in the month. Um, we went down with it. We didn't recover as much as the market did, and as we've um, said that a lot of the um, recovery has been in a handful of companies that we don't own. Uh, but we are finding good opportunity outside of that. When we're paying two and a half times or five times free cash flow for businesses and they are growing earnings, um, we actually think um, there's upside to these businesses. And you'll see a re-rating just as you've seen with Channel 9 over the past year. So Channel 9 was a similar story last year. It was trading about five times free cash flow. And that's re-rated to 10 times now. And that's what's driven that 126% price increase so what we're seeing is a lot of opportunity out there. If you look at our numbers over the past year and past uh, two years, we're actually delivering pretty good returns. Um, we actually think the outlook is, is, is pretty good for our funds, um, despite some of the speculative um, investments which are going on out there, which we're avoiding. So we, we think there's good value to be found in some of the traditional businesses. Excellent, guys. Look, thanks. Thank you very much for that summary. It's always fascinating to get your insights into the small and micro cap market, both in terms of your portfolio um, highlights and uh, what you guys look out for in terms of good investments and, um, and what investments to avoid. Just a reminder that all attendees do have the opportunity to ask questions, and this can be done by clicking on the questions tab on your screen. We certainly have had a couple of questions come in. Um, the first one uh, is on one of the stocks you would have seen in the top 10 there. 
uh, it's crept into the top 10 on Mortgage Choice. Mortgage Choice has been a, uh, a small company stock that's been under pressure from the banking inquiry. What's your view on the outlook and prospects for Mortgage Choice? Yeah, Mark, there has been pressure on the share price. The valuation is pretty compelling now. Obviously, the risk is that there is a change in commission structure in the industry, and that has happened in other verticals. So there is some risk around that. Now, there's been reviews in the past, and in the past, uh, the government has decided or elected not to change the commission structure. And the reason for that, if they do eliminate commissions and basically eliminate the need for brokers um, and make brokers uneconomic, what you see is that competition will abate in the industry and banks will go back to dominating distribution. If banks dominate distribution, um, you'll have to walk into a bank and you won't have a selection of banks um, products to choose from, you'll just have to take that, that, that product from that bank. And so what you'll see is just that the power and the power of the banks will increase and their margins will go up and that will be the at the expense of consumers. So what brokers do is they actually off offer a panel and by providing that panel they actually um, increase competition um, for the banks and for those providers of mortgages. Now the elimination of brokers would see an elimination of competition and would just simply, uh, banks would end up monopolising the industry, which is not a good outcome, not the outcome the government wants, not the outcome anyone in the industry wants. Um, the only positive for that would be the banks. The, bot the banks would win out in that circumstance. So we think it unlikely that the government will mess with, uh, with commissions. If they do, Mortgage Choice can run its book off and we think there is value in running that book off. However, that runoff value would be less than the current share price. Okay, good answer. Um, guys, you're talking retailers. How have Adairs and Vita Group gone, as you have mentioned them in the past? Yeah, sure. Uh, look, thanks for the question, Mark. The, um, both stocks have actually performed pretty well. Adairs has done a little better than Vita Group to date, but um, we bought both uh, very cheaply on a cash flow basis with attractive valuations. Uh, Adairs, has, as you've probably seen, had, had stellar results uh, over the last season and actually updated, upgraded numbers a couple of times. Vita Group's recovered a bit, but um, but then sold off a little bit. We still think there's real valuation support for Vita Group. Uh, the market's probably misunderstood its move into um, into the Neiman market. The, it's moving from telcos into an adjacent category, but we think there's real potential long-term upside in that in that as well. So both still track to be valued in our, in our view and performed pretty well to date. Excellent. Okay, guys. Um, talking media, uh, your view on Southern Cross Media? Yeah, look, Southern Cross Media... Uh, its radio business has lost some share in the metro market to ARN, which is owned by HT1, which we also own. The radio market is growing, however, so you know they're going to ride that benefit in terms of that wave. Um, they are trying to rebuild their share, and, and the first survey that came out is indicating that they are rebuilding today FM to some degree, which should probably be to the detriment of the competitors. But Southern Cross, um, they've done a great job remediating the balance sheet over the last couple of years. So the balance sheet's improved dramatically. The cash flow dynamics of the business are fantastic. And the stock is trading at six times EBIT or six times free cash flow. So a lot of negatives are priced into the company. At the end of the day, it is quite a strategic business. And that it, um, it would be very appealing for one of the networks to actually, well, the TV networks to actually buy it out. Um, and there would be significant cost duplication between a TV network and a radio network, as there would be um, across any of the media verticals. So there is a good story here from a, you know, from a valuation perspective, from an industry perspective, and also from a consolidation perspective. Okay, uh, another stock-specific question, guys. Uh, uh, an update on Icentia and the and the CEO. Yeah, look, uh, Icentia is gone through its troubles in recent times. It has derated uh, significantly. They actually met their guidance at the result. And I, I'm not sure why the share price fell. I think it fell because maybe the CEO left and he has been integral to the business. But to be fair, to be frank, um, the performance of the company under the CEO has been pretty, pretty, pretty poor. We actually see him moving on as quite a positive. Um, we think there's a significant cost out in the business. There's 1,300 people working at Icentia. It is an old media type company. It is cost heavy, and the new management or the CFO are taking actions. They're going to take out significant costs over the next 18 months, and you're going to see a benefit to shareholders. You're also seeing some benefits coming through from um, from a top-down perspective, in that um, their competitor, which is Meltwater, which has been taking market share, 
it looks like they're going to have to pay more for the copyright costs, which means they're going to have to keep prices up or lift prices at some point, which will benefit Icentia. Um, so if you get prices going up in terms of revenue and you get costs going down, you should see a, a, a stabilisation of the Icentia business and potentially moving back into growth over the next 18 months. Okay, guys. Um, uh, one comment here is uh, a client's seen sub um, several substantial shareholder notices uh, with Siri at the moment. Do you just want to comment on how you position and uh, sizing and liquidity uh, you manage the portfolio? Yeah, sure. Well, and that's one of the reasons we have got, you know, we, we flagged earlier we've got capacity limitations and we will adhere to those pretty strictly. So. We've effectively said that we don't have a lot of upside left in microcap, so we've got a little bit of capacity left in that fund, and then we'll probably cap out. And then smalls, as Mark said, there's a little bit of runway there. But um, you know, we manage those. I mean, <clears throat> many small cap funds have and do lots of lots of financials if, if the funds are reasonable size. It's not uncommon to, to you know to deal with that. Um, we tend to try and trade blocks and find liquidity where we can. And um, obviously, we, we have an obligation to disclose when we become a five percent shareholder. Uh, so far, the prices are going well, and we think it's been pretty manageable. It hasn't um, hasn't impacted our performance to date. So, you know, we had those those constraints in mind. That was all built in, you know, with that with that in mind. So it's just a natural part of doing business in, in small caps. Yeah, we we have high conviction in what we do, but we also manage to size limitations in the funds. Um, the only stocks that are above five percent of any of the portfolios are Certex and AWE. And the reason for that is because they're under takeover and the companies that have come in and acquired them have bought, um, have obviously paid a big price for those, those companies. So every other position is less than 5%. Um, those companies that we have invested in have good balance sheets and generate good cash flow so that we know they can self-fund through the cycle. And most of them are very cheap. Um, you look at Vita Group, Mark has talked about that. It's on seven times EBIT or seven times cash flow. Um, you know, it's got real cash flow behind it. Uh, there's companies out there like GetSwift, Updater, et cetera, which barely have any revenue, which have more market cap than these companies. So look, at the end of the day, we need to have conviction. We're not taking massive concentrated bets in the portfolios, as you can see. You've got, and so there, as, I, as I mentioned at the start, there's around $20 million in capacity left in the microcap fund and uh, about uh, high hundreds in terms of the, uh, the series small cap fund. Yeah, it's about, yeah, it's a bit over 200. Um, look, that's all the questions we've got today. Um, if anyone's got any further questions, please do not hesitate to contact one of the members of the, the Pinnacle Distribution. We'd certainly like to thank everyone for their participation today, and if, we look forward to catching up with you either on our next webinar or in your offices. Thank you very much, and have a good day.